Great. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks very much for having us here today. Um, Andy and I have been working together for the last um, 10 years, and our work um, goes across art, um, architecture, and activism. I guess from the start, we've always responded to, I guess, our, our fears um, about the destruction of the natural world, but also um, the destruction of, of human nature and the way that commerce and uh, the world around us is rapidly changing the way we interact together. Um, we tried to present hopeful and playful solutions to these massive challenges that we see. Um, and we make art that poses um, solutions rather than just sitting there asking questions and things you can kind of just look at and uh, question. Um, so we're going to spend a few minutes talking about some projects we've done before and before talking about um, the main project today called The Manuals. Um, so we started working together um, 10 years ago, and our first project was called Farm Shop. And this was a, um, a farm in a shop. Um, we took over an empty building in Dalston and um, reintroduced people to the idea of um, agriculture in the city. Um, 100 people turned up on the first day we opened to volunteer, to explore, to learn about different ways of interacting with um, the landscape and with um, the, the landscape that sits behind the food they eat. Um, this was also one of the first projects that we landed right in the middle of it and had to start learning how to run an actual space and build a community um, around us. And that's become a really important tool that we use throughout all of our work. Um, we've also now repeated this project in Istanbul and found the same sense of urgency around people wanting to reconnect with their landscapes, reconnect with food. What we do is create a space and then bring people together um, to make that happen. Um, another project um, which follows along a similar theme happened to the 2012 Olympics. Um, we were, um, I guess, worried about the lack of social connection in London um, and also that people were living very, very stressed lives. Um, so for the Olympics, we built a, um, a custom spa, um, a, a building, which um, we went out and found incredible people who were therapists in the area from local beauty schools, um, just people in the area who had skill with their hands, um, skill with their voice, could soothe people. And we created this, um, this installation which both reconnected people with nature, but also um, provided um, a meeting place and a meeting point. And much of our work is doing that, a form of, um, I guess, um, architectural acupuncture. We put ideas into town centres and places, and people come together to, um, to form communities. So this was a place you could bathe amongst trees, muck about and hang out drinking in the sauna um, with strangers you'd never met before. Um, so after four months of um, weirdness and nakedness, uh, the structure was moved to the local library, and um, it's continued working there as a spa um, until this day, and this was back in 2012. The last project you saw started in 2010. Um, and actually, through our work, um, because we believe in building legacy into public sculptures, they continue to live and breathe beyond the object that we create. Um, we've now built five organizations that employ 20 people and give space to hundreds of different people to, to come within them. So we start with a, an artistic idea, a sculpture, but that sculpture keeps living because we design the organizations behind it um, that make it kind of live and breathe beyond our first intervention. Sometimes these projects are also um, temporary. Um, this was a garden we built at um, Tate, Tate Britain this year, um, and um, this was, a, I guess, a place which is historically um, a colonial space, and so we used the, the language of a garden to introduce people from all around London and just say, look, you come in now, you take over this space, you make it your own. Um, and to do this, we have to build the, 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 kind of, um, the connections and the community around the space. Um, and most of our work goes into that, this organisation building as artwork, which people then occupy and fill. The other half of our work, which is linked to the manuals project you'll, you'll hear about, so the first half is this organisation building, this deep immersion into creating sustainable artworks, durable artworks, which are also public and performative. But the other side is building things for nature. Um, we see the huge challenges that natural systems are facing. And this was a project with um, Kew Garden, Kew Gardens, where we worked with um, soil researchers to design um, machines, mini machines, that could manufacture soil from scratch. So you'll find that soil is actually not a renewable resource. It's being depleted at such a rate. So we worked to create um, freeze-thaw machines, which could crack rocks, um, mini micro rivers, um, and also kind of rotting machines. And then together, these could assemble um, a collection of machines which made soil. This was a project, again, speculative, of, of imagining a world without the oceans producing fish and chips in a seaside town in the UK. 
Um, and so we built a fish and chips machine um, on the rooftop of a local school. Um, and you could come up and watch fish being farmed, um, chips being grown, um, tartar sauce, um, all being made within the sculpture. It failed miserably because obviously it takes much, much longer to make fish and chips than you imagine. But for us, it was, a, again, a speculation, a playful way of looking at uh, this dish. And just before I kind of um, hand over to Andy to start talking about the manuals, um, I want to touch on this project because it, it, it was very early in our, in our work, but it also um, is a nod to the future. So whilst we spent a lot of time building communities of people and learning the details of how that works, this was creating a community for nature. And so we worked with Swift experts to create a, um, a colony structure which the birds could then occupy. And this is now home to a, a colony of, of Swifts. And it's using, um, I guess, art and sculpture to recreate and rebuild ecosystems. Each of, those, um, each of those boxes is designed so that a Swift can identify it as their own home. Um, speakers were put inside the sculpture to attract the birds um, because we've seen, again, a huge ecosystem collapse and, um, and biodiversity collapse in bird species in the UK. And we want to use art as the kind of entry point, the discussion point for rebringing back um, those communities. Hello, I'm going to talk quickly. Uh, so this manuals. The manuals is a new long-term project that we are currently developing. It explores a new culture where humans create rather than destroy ecosystems through our everyday actions by reappropriating the objects, infrastructure, and systems that currently just underpin humanity. The book will act as an imperfect master plan. We acknowledge that mistakes happen, approaches must change, and our first steps will not be our final actions. The manuals proposes change through new pieces of land art, which will act as prototyping for wider, uh, large-scale systematic change. Together, we, uh, we uh, with experts and the general public, will assemble a book that acts as both a practical guide and promotes a system of belief. The manuals will contain open source blueprints and how-to instructions for transform our, transforming our man-made surroundings into new landscapes that provide for the other 8 million species who call Earth home. Right now, we think, build, and behave in ways that support humans' way of life al alone. How can change a landscape and mindset turn the tide of mass destruction into mass construction that connects, connects us with the natural world in the process? One of the chapters of, uh, will look at war. It's been increasingly said that we need a wartime mentality to combat the ecological um, and climatic emergency we are facing. Taking this quite literally, what can we learn from war and how can its techniques, machinery, military minds be reappropriated for the benefit of ecosystems? Not just protecting what currently exists, but actually rebuilding lost ecosystems. War is at the forefront of innovation and is geared to work towards both mentally and physically acting quickly. Both these attributes are needed to turn the tables on, on the destruction of biodiversity and climate change. So how can instruments of war be re reinterpreted for the benefit of the planet? One example could be bombs. Many species of plants have seeds that delay germination, remaining in the soil seed bank for more than 50 years before germinating. When a landscape is bombed, the disruption of the ground can bring up seeds that had lain dormant underground or locked under man-made surfaces. For instance, in post-World War II cities, the widespread bombing of the ground brought, brought about a new urban ecology. Pictured is the Barbican in central London, shown on the left in the, um, in the 1940s, and on the right in the 1950s, sorry. Through our infrastructure, we have capped off seeds on large areas of the planet. So we propose, firstly, bombing some of these, like car parks. Not only would this act, act expose trap seeds, the craters can naturally fill with water, creating a wonderful geomatic Ge geometric patterned wetland. Can we legitimize the economical effects this bombing might have? We have done extreme things in the name of progress, such as the damming of the Yangtze River in China that displaced six million people, or the numerous examples of where roads were built straight through, through our cities because we valued the economy and cars more than cities. How much do we value nature, and how far are we, are we ready to go in the t to turn the tide on econo uh, ecological disaster? Another of the book's chapters explores new systems of belief. In the near future culture, it will be important to have places to remember and reflect about what we have done to nature. 
past and present cultures always create temples and shrines to what they believe in, whether that's a factory and shopping center or cathedral and church. Our current offshoot project from the book will be a sculpture called Heavy Ecology, which will act as a living shrine for wild birds. The project is set around the history of heavy industry and lost ecology on the banks of the River Thames in Barking, East London. A coal-fired power station four times the size of Tate Modern was once sited there, and it dumped its waste on the surrounding land, killing the marshland in the process. But this act inadvertently allowed a new ecosystem to build itself because the land became so polluted that people left. This provided a huge area of land, the time and space to build a new post-industrial ecology. In the making of heavy ecology, we will reuse the elements from large infrastructure projects, salvaging an intercontinental gas pipeline that they overordered by four kilometers and leftover legs from a large bridge. In the process, we'll be turning human-centric infrastructure into ecological infrastructure. It will, it will act as a permanent living shrine to wild birds, a place to pay homage, and a gateway to a near, new world where we build industrial-scale bird boxes, not factories. As part of Systems of Belief, we, we have looked at cemeteries and their ability to build and protect ecosystems. Pictured are Towers of Silence. They are circular ray structures found in Iran and India and built for dead bodies to be exposed and eaten by vultures, which in turn redistribute the body back into the ecosystem. Our bodies are fat, stacked full of nutrients that when we die, we could feed into nature's loop. But generally, as part of our parting act, we bury our bodies so deep into the earth that nothing can get to the nutrients or we burn ourselves, releasing a load of carbon in the air as a final finger up to the planet. Our dead bodies can provide nutrients whilst our cemeteries could provide protection. The world over, burial sites are considered sacred and as such are mostly built, built around, not on, even in our hyper-capitalistic world where the price of land is premium. Within cemeteries, the structures we cover, or cover our dead could provide protection. Tombstones tend to be heavy structures and with, it, and with a redesign could become barriers and obstacles to the mechanisms that destroy ecosystems. What land could we take to create these new cemeteries? On the left is a great diagram that clearly shows how industrial farming methods destroy biodiversity. On the right is, the, is a pattern of how a tractor plows a field. Agriculture, like everything we do, is built on certain patterns and systems. Tractors, for example, have to plow in certain ways. So the new sacred cemeteries would have tombstones placed in such a way that they would block tractors, reclaiming the land with new ecosystems being born through our dead. So we are starting a project redesigning uh, designing new hybrid structures that combine the functions of road barriers, coastal defences and anti-tank iron crosses with gravestones looping our dead back into, the, back into and protecting nature. <laughs> I'm just going to end also on um, a project which we're launching which looks at consumption. Obviously shopping trolleys are the embodiment of our destructive relationship with stuff and how that's destroying everything around us. Um, and there's no better, I guess, example of this industrial um, consumption complex we have. Um, we load them with packaged products. We take them home and don't think little of the impacts on the earth and landscape around us. What we want to do is, um, I guess, repurpose this throwaway item. You know, I don't know if it happens here, but in the UK, waterways and, and coastlines are littered with um, shopping trolleys discarded into them. What we're looking to do is to essentially take this destructive object and we're working with the Whitstable Biennial to start a project which will use shopping trolleys to recreate oyster reefs. Um, oysters are an incredible um, species. They, each oyster will clean 50 gallons of water each day. Um, and we're working with the Zoological Society of London, the Blue Marine Foundation and local, local oyster men to essentially create a piece of land art and sculpture using shopping trolleys which will recreate and build both an ecosystem and a, and a livelihood for local people in the Thames Estuary. Um, this is the site of the project in the Thames Estuary in the southeast of England. It's a deprived area. Um, and I think what we're saying is that the manuals is not just a physical project, but also it's an underpinning organizational project to build ecosystems, to build organizations like we've done with our previous work. This isn't new. Um, we often look at recent history for our inspiration. But actually, if you go to the distant past in the 1800s, here is a map showing in the brown areas um, the oyster reefs around the channel between the UK and continental Europe. Um, in Roman times, the channel of water would run clear because the amount of waters 
filter, uh, the amount of oysters filtering the water, but also oysters were, were food that um, everyone ate, um, regardless of background, because they were so plentiful in the Thames um, and in the Channel. So the trolley reefs we create, they will mimic um, the technique used by fishermen um, growing oysters around the world. Um, and the oysters will grow on top of each other to create complex three-dimensional structures. Um, within these structures, then, the oysters also support um, many, many other um, species. And they create fisheries and places for, for other species to grow. This is the, uh, the structure. So we'll be filling um, a, a part of uh, the estuary um, with this pattern of, um, of shopping trolleys. And each of these will do a, a number of things. They build a keystone ecosystem. Um, and they use something negative to create something positive. Um, they protect the oysters from drowning in sediment by lifting them above the seafloor. They also create a potential for a new form of livelihood for coastal communities, um, a natural barrier against coastal erosion. And we're using the shopping trolleys because um, trolley also they stop boats dredging. So anyone trying to dredge will be kind of caught up and tangled in the, uh, the shopping trolleys put within the water. Yeah. Um, so just to kind of end, um, I guess we're asking the question, the manuals will be posing this question to everybody. What new human systems and monuments can we build to rebuild nature? What can you all do with your own work to support this? So we're continuing to build a core team of experts and also project partners like the Arts Council England, Tate Exchange, the Barbican Design Museum and the Whitsville Biennial. We're asking people to go to the website to get involved and we'll be kind of fielding examples of, of I guess, creative and imaginative ways to try to redesign uh, and use our own wits to redesign nature around us. Thank you.